Hi everyone, my name is Mary O'Keefe. Welcome to this discussion about a new paper published in the European Journal of Pain on translational pain research. It's a very important paper and I'm delighted to be joined by four of the authors, Thomas Graven Nielsen, Andre Morrill, Kirsty Bannister and Suzanne Becker. So we're going to discuss various aspects of the paper. So Thomas, we'll start with you. Would you like to tell us what exactly is translational pain research? Well, that's definitely why I've invited my good colleagues here today to, to tell you about that. But fundamentally, it's about translating findings from basic settings, from the animal studies, for example, to something which can be used in, as a human translationable uh, component. Fundamentally, today, we do not have a very sufficient pain management strategies, as we all agree on. And it's interesting that there's actually quite a lot of basic findings, which looks promising. But when we start to move them into a clinical field, they are fundamentally failing. Uh, so, so that's what we have worked with in this, uh, this, in this position paper. And uh, I would also like to mention that there's actually three other colleagues uh, involved in this paper here. David Finn from Ireland, uh, Shishel Pickering, uh, and Esther pogatsky san who could unfortunately not join us here today. So uh, we are, uh, as a group, uh, a, a one of, uh, part of the IFIC uh, Research Committee on Translational Pain Research. So that's why we took up this opportunity to, to focus on the gaps and opportunities opportunities uh, in this field. Okay, thank you. So Andre, we'll move to you and I have some questions about the clinical and human side of the translational part of the paper. And just to give a bit of background to myself before I go into the question, I was reading this from the perspective of a clinical pain researcher. My background is in chronic back pain and I don't have any background in basic science. And I was nodding along as I was reading this because I haven't seen clinically any advances in how we're treating chronic back pain specifically. And the, the, the treatments we currently have don't work that well. You know, in the trials, we see very small effects and they don't last very long. And another frustration on the clinical side is that when a treatment doesn't work, we're not really sure why it doesn't work. And even if it works a bit, we're also not sure why. So we, we, we seem that there, there, there's a huge stumbling block there for us to progress further. And just for the clinical population or the clinical researchers that might be listening to this is the problem for us as well is that because we keep failing on the treatment side in, 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 in the clinical research is there seems to be a move towards encouraging patients with pain to you know, accept their pain or give up on treatments or to, to focus totally on self-management. So this seems to be stifling, you know, actually new treatment approaches. But then when I was reading this paper, I felt more positive, you know, that we need to be working towards and bridging the gap between what we're learning in the basic science side to the clinical research side. So that's, that, that's my background. So the, the, the question to, to start with is, what do you feel are the main and the more, more recent breakthroughs in our understanding of pain that you feel will eventually be used to test new treatments in the clinical population with pain? Yeah, um, it's, it's, a, it's actually, I, I think maybe one of the, the important breakthroughs is, is actually related um, exactly to, to your point. Um, and, the, and also, so the, for me, one, one of the breakthroughs is, is actually simply the fact that we are increasingly recognizing that clinical trial endpoints should not focus exclusively on pain ratings, uh, but instead should, should really carefully assess how, how treatments can modulate uh, the, the functional consequences and the impact of chronic pain, such as uh, how they can modulate mood, uh, expectations, uh, sleep quality, uh, physical functioning, and and pain-related interference with daily activities. So uh, it, it's not, in a sense, it's not really a scientific breakthrough, like a discovery of a new mechanism, but I think recognizing uh, that this is probably what's the most important to assess when we are evaluating treatments could actually, I would actually consider it as a, as a recent and important, um, break, uh, important breakthrough. Um, 
maybe another aspect then more related to, to understanding pain or understanding uh, pain mechanisms, which, which could be applied in, in patients um, is, I mean, we, we, we have progressed quite a lot in our understanding of the mechanisms that underlie the potential mechanisms that underlie the modulation of nociceptive signals and the modulation of the, the pain experience, including how, how psychological cognitive affective factors can, can modulate this pain experience. And I think this is opening now the, the prospect to, to stratify patients in functionally distinct groups, uh, maybe also to predict response to treatment. Um, and yeah, as, as we explain in our paper, one reason we believe uh, could be one of the reasons that could explain current uh, treatment failures or, or failures of clinical trials could be that the treatments are maybe given sometimes to the wrong patients or at the wrong moment in time. And, um, and so, yeah, understanding better those mechanisms, and I think we are improving in our understanding of that could, could actually uh, lead us to propose more tailored treatments and more personalized medicine. Yeah. yeah. And you've outlined a, a, few, a few criticisms that, that, that why there might be a failure to translate findings uh, across into the clinical side. Do you think there are certain mistakes also that clinical researchers like me or clinicians make in maybe ignoring the importance of certain mechanisms or certain factors in basic science? Mm -hmm. Or so that, that's a difficult question, but are, are there that's certain very things that question. gloss yeah. over? I would say it could possibly actually the, the mistake could go probably maybe a bit both ways in the sense that uh, Often we are making shortcuts between mechanisms and observations we can make in, uh, in animal mothers or in healthy volunteers. And then we, we, we tend to consider or assume that this can be generalized to the patient population. And, and the opposite is probably also, also, also a, bit, uh, a bit true. So I guess one of the, the important, one of the difficulties is whether findings that are derived from studies conducted, for example, in healthy human volunteers can actually generalize to patient situations. That, that remains, in my view, uh, uh, still a um, still, uh, still very um, open, uh, open question. Um, yeah, another difficulty uh, uh, probably in, in research conducted in patients is, is um, yeah, the question of causality. So, so how to interpret differences that we can observe in patients with pain, for example, compared to, to controls. Um, is it, are we actually looking at a pre-existing trait? Are we looking at uh, something that is consequential to the presence of ongoing pain or to other consequences of the, this chronic pain, uh, pain experience? And so, um, yeah, like, like we, we explain in, in, in the paper, our, our view is that um, probably we, we need more uh, studies uh, in conditions where pain-free baseline recordings can be obtained. Or, or also longitudinal studies in, in recurrent pain conditions where we can obtain multiple measures at different periods in time in, a, in patients to try to assess a bit this question of, of, of causality and, and also of the, yeah, the clinical relevance of the different mechanisms that have been identified in animal models or in healthy human volunteer studies. Yeah. Great. Now, Kirsty, we'll move to you. So I have some questions about the, the basic animal research part of the translational paper. And obviously animal research is vital to understanding pain and making progress in that area. But as, as you say in the paper, it, it's very difficult to make the long journey all the way from animal research to healthy human volunteers, then all the way to the clinical population with patients. So in your view, what are the main challenges to translating animal research findings into, into human populations, uh, hopefully patients? And how may we overcome those challenges going forward? So, I mean, the issues are obviously several. Um, most pertinently, the process of interpreting in awake animals, for example, a result that may be symptomatic of pain is a, is a major limitation. We can move towards overcoming these challenges by applying multidimensional pain assays, for example, locomotor activity monitoring in the home cage. And these more likely represent objective correlates um, for, as one example, movement evoked pain in patients after surgery. Meanwhile, if we then think about uh, disease and symptom specific models, 
identifying mechanisms that drive a pain state opens the potential for treatment targets to be pursued in, in those defined clinical settings. So one of the major goals is to gain a steer on the identity of novel therapeutic targets that translate to pain research and or clinical trials in patients. And studying pain circuitry in animals is a crucial step towards the identification of such targets. And that's true both in health and disease. Yep. There was one really important part of the paper where you, you all were talking about back translation. And that was something I had not heard of before. When I think of translation, I'm always thinking from animals to humans. But you spoke about the importance of actual human research, improving animal research, like improving the relevance of the models. I'm not sure if I've got the understanding of back translation uh, correct, but is, is that how it would work? Or is there a better definition of that? Or how, how might that play out in reality? So, I mean, the reality is when we talk about translational pain research, we absolutely are talking bench to bedside and bedside to bench with that experimental pain setting somewhere in the middle. So when we think specifically about backward translation, it can include a repurpose of human experimental approaches into animal settings that was discussed in the paper. And at the heart of the matter, that back translation is vital when considering a refinement of the animal models that we use, which is really important if we actually want to uh, more successfully complete forward translation. So if we can substantiate that a paradigm used in uh, human psychophysical testing, for example, can evoke equivalent or measurable aspects of a nociceptive response in healthy animals, then in turn, the field of forward translation progresses. So improved understanding of the effects of neuronal modulatory therapeutic mechanisms in human studies would benefit from further back translation to preclinical models. So I think people often think that that translation is animal to human, but actually, you know, for those of us who really stand on the, on the bridge between bench and bedside, it, it, it's absolutely fundamentally both ways. That's great. That's very interesting because that was something I, I didn't really know much about before the paper. And I have one more question specifically on, on the animal research is that, are there specific research questions that we can do in animals that we'd love to answer in humans, but that it would be very, very difficult to actually do in humans? It would be very hard to recruit the participants and do those types of experiments in human participants. Even even one or two examples would be, would be good. I mean Absolutely, yeah. When you think about animal research, we have the possibility to dissect mechanisms driving effective and sensory pain states in a manner of detail in terms of specific spinal neuronal recordings or brain neuronal recordings that are just not possible in humans. Um, and this is because disease and symptom specific models can be studied uh, with, the, uh, with the aim of identifying the mechanisms that relate to specific pain states and to specific pain circuitries. So the anatomy, the functionality, uh, the pharmacology of discrete neuronal circuitries fundamental to those pain processing pathways can be quantified in animals in health and chronicity. And this allows us to pinpoint dysfunctionalities and maladaptive uh, plasticity in spinal and supraspinal circuits in a manner that we just can't do it in humans. But in turn, by revealing those um, maladaptive circuits, for example, we can reveal novel targetable mechanisms for, for future forward translation uh, for therapeutic trials. That's great. Yeah, thanks for answering that because uh, sometimes as a clinical researcher, some people can dismiss the animal research as, as, as not translating fast enough into the human research findings. So that's really good. So Suzanne, the next section was, I had some questions about the psychobiological part of the translational paper. And in clinical research, we know that psychological factors are very important. You know, stuff like fear and expectations and depression in driving pain. But in the clinic, we're limited in that we measure these things using subjective self-report measures. And if we, if we had a better understanding of what was underlying these factors, we might develop better treatment targets. So the first question is, what would you say are the main findings from basic science at the moment that would help us understand the biological underpinnings of psychological factors? 
I would say that we have already learned a lot about the biological underpinnings of psychological factors that are also relevant in pain, as you just outlined, uh, for example, from the research on anxiety or depression, but also expectation reward. And as just said before, from that animal work or the basic science we work, we can learn um, very much about very relevant specific mechanisms for or anatomy or functionality in brain networks or even single cells. Um, that are very relevant, for example, in the um, perception of fear or reward processing that are also very relevant in the context of pain. Those results show a very fine-grained picture of mechanisms also on a molecular level that are impossible to gain from human research, as we just said before, just because of the limitations in the methods we are allowed or actually we are able to use in humans. But it is terribly important. We need such, fine grain, such a fine-grained understanding to understand the mechanisms of pain, including chronic pain, and importantly also to use that knowledge to find better treatment options that are actually based on mechanisms in instead of just being only symptom-oriented, as it is very often the case at the moment. Yes. And in terms of doing this type of research in animals, what are the main challenges to, to doing type, I'm thinking from a psychological factor perspective, it seems that it would be much easier in humans, but that's based on my lack of knowledge. What are the, what are the main challenges, I guess, doing this type of stuff in animals? I would say it's very simple because we just can't ask the animals, we can't ask non-human populations how they feel, what they fear, how they perceive the threat of a pain or whatever. We always have to rely on observable behavior and that observable behavior has to be interpreted in the end by the researchers and that of course includes a kind of very subjective human interpretation of all. And that of course limits strongly which psychological, fa psychological factors and psychobiological mechanisms we can actually investigate then in non-human populations. But, and it's in, of course then very likely that we do not get the full, full picture. picture on one hand, because we do not necessarily know which psychological factors play actually a role in non-human populations, and also then how to assess them. And on the other hand, not all the factors we know to be relevant in human pain experience can then be actually back translated to the basic science um, in investigations, because as we said before, it's a very complex and, and um, picture that incorporates so many modulatory factors where we just have no idea at the moment how to back translate that then to the basic science. Yes. The, the other question I had was, it's going a bit off track, but it's, it's something that a lot of us wonder, will it ever happen? Is that even if we find that psychological factors have a very prominent role in an individual's pain presentation. Do you ever see the day where there could be an objective measure of pain that we could measure that mm. that, that person is having a pain experience? It, it's, a, it's obviously a, another complex question, but <laughs> we, we often I, wonder about it. Yeah. I think it is conceivable that eventually we can as achieve such an objective measure of pain. But there is a still a very long way to go. We need to understand the neurobiological underpinnings of exactly that subjective experience with all the modulatory factors on all those psychological factors, including emotions, cognitions, expectations, fear, the interconnections of all those factors and so on. And in addition, before being able to implement that actually in real life situations, we also need to be able to apply this on an individual level, considering the huge variation that we have actually between individuals in the perception, in the processing, in the modulatory factors. I think nevertheless, we have actually, there have been actually quite many interesting advances in basic and clinical research going exactly in that direction. And especially focusing not only on the pure nociceptive processes, but also on the aversiveness of pain or the importance of emotional motivation factors, which appear to be actually the driving force in pain in humans and in animals. And I think that puts us on the right track. But as I said before, there's still a very long way to go. <laughs> okay, that, that was great. Um, I have one more question for Thomas. So we're after discussing some of the, the main aspects of, of the paper. 
And it's clear that we could benefit from basic science researchers and clinical researchers working together more on, on, on these issues. What do you think are the key things that are needed to get different types of researchers working together instead of in the silos that we often find ourselves in? Well, well, actually, I don't see any major problems in us working together. I think it's just important that we identify where should we work together. Uh, that, that's really important. And for example, from my perspective, it's not a, an, an um, objective for me to find the objective measure of pain because I don't think that's possible, for example. I think we should focus on mechanisms. I think we should focus on this backwards translational uh, manifestation of things we can see in patients, things we can see in as mechanisms in, in humans and in healthy humans, and then try to work on a backwards translation there. Um, but also I'm very much in, in favor of looking at this from an interdisciplinary perspective. Again, the psychobiology can actually change a lot of the biological mechanisms that we are dealing with nowadays. So it's so important that we get them in to the play. And we can see that from many of our studies that this is so important that we start to, to, to look at that in details as well. And then another point, which is very important, which we have not talked so much about today is diversity. For example, age and, and sex from the basic science to the, uh, to the, uh, the clinical setting, it's, it's fundamental. I mean, the big discussion today is that most basic science has been done on on, on male rats are kind of, right? And, and we need to look at things much more diversely uh, uh, picture here. So, uh, so I think that's, that's where we should try to, to uh, identify target areas. And, and you can see we are already eight people who have a strong interest in, in working together on this. So I don't see any problems in us working together as long as we set up the, the right framework for this.